You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brook, That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brook, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. And my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It's also available on Apple, Spotify, and Google, and any other places you can find podcasts. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what I hear. I always appreciate your like what you hear, rather. I always appreciate that. And as a reminder, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching, and you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or by email at david at thatgratitudeguy.com. So let me get on to the show and introduce you to my guest. My guest this week is Cindy O'Neill Dady. So let me tell you a little bit about Cindy. Cindy has over 15 years of experience as a business relationship marketing strategist. She founded Exceptional Connections Networking in 2009 out of a deep burning desire to fulfill her I am statement. I am an exceptional uh, connector. As the chief exceptional connector, she has become a leader and the person of influence guiding hundreds of business professionals to achieve long-term meaningful relationships. This led her to create and teach an innovative six-step process focused on authentic human connections, which encourages, educates, and empowers people to deepen relationships, inspire change, and build trust. Cindy is fiercely committed to creating nurturing relationship-based environments where business professionals turn connections into powerful advocates and raving fans. She is also a contributing author in an audio compilation on women of influence. Cindy is a true garden tender who is passionate about being an exceptional connector, nurturing her network, and cultivating, I love all these references to garden, a beautiful and nourishing organic garden. Cindy, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. I just, I'm so excited to be here to be able to talk to you and especially um, that gratitude guy, because, you know, uh, gratitude is so important for all of our lives. It sure is. And it may be maybe more important now than at any other time in the past, just given a lot of our circumstances. So let me start off with to the best of your memory. I know I have my memory. Tell the viewers and the listeners how you and I met. Gosh, we met years ago. I'm thinking 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a kind of a, a chance encounter. Yet uh, some, a friend referred me to speak to you. You must meet David. He's amazing. And he has a similar spirit and heart for gratitude that you do. And so uh, I think we met in a Panera. <laughs> Mm -hmm. As I recall, and a mutual friend of ours joined us and which made it extra fun. So, uh, and my husband was there as well. So um, I was lucky enough to be surrounded by three amazing men. That's as that is a very accurate memory. I remember that well, too. And so I, I'm going to want to talk about this connections aspect a little bit because it's such a big part of what you do. Uh, certainly uh, professionally, but I think also personally as well, but kind of back up and talk about a little bit of the early days of Cindy, you know, maybe post high school, college, and the first type of jobs you did kind of take us back there to start us a little bit about more about your journey. Oh, wow. Going down memory lane here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I was a good student. Um, I was on the senior varsity tennis team, speech and debate team in high school, um, worked at uh, savings and loan. Um, my uh, junior and senior year uh, worked as, a, let's see, I started out as a sales clerk at House of Fabrics. I loved to sew and ended up being, um, you know, uh, assistant manager. Um, when I was at the savings and loan, um, I was being groomed for management for banking. Um, I opted to go to college and get my college education. I got four years at University of California, Irvine, major in, in English, minor in Spanish. Um, and 
and then I got married and we, my husband and I, at the time we moved to Indiana and he was pre-med, um, he had family in Indiana. And uh, so we were just settling in there. I had one child in Indiana and, um, and then was a stay-at-home mom. I, I you know, was just taking care of my daughter um, at that point. And then we moved to California, had another child, um, moved to Oceanside, uh, and, you know, just life goes on. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, um, you know, in, in terms of I, just being a mom was important to me. And I had been doing a lot of reading, um, about homeschooling and I was just really intrigued by, uh, just the concept and out al- and also very inspired by the results that families were getting that were homeschooling. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just didn't think I could do it. I was like, I don't know if I could do this, but it sounds really amazing. And it's something that I would love to do, but I felt like I was, so I embraced that mindset, mm-hmm. even though I didn't have the courage to call it homeschooling at the time. So when my daughter was born really for the first five years, essentially I was homeschooling her and I encourage other parents that they are also. So to embrace it, whether they decide to put their kids in public school or private school, you know, essentially they're homeschooling their kids. Right. <laughs> it's right. a good thing. Um, so, you know, that, that was kind of just my life and having kids. And, um, and I don't know, you didn't ask about this, but, you know, a very difficult thing happened in my family in our life. My mom had breast cancer and uh, around that time it came back. Mm. And it's an important part of my journey. Um, because you, you know, you talk about gratitude and, you know, I really believe that there's certain things, muscles that are built, you know, in us and through diverse, you know, through difficult times. So, um, you know, basically I was a mom, um, two kids married, uh, pregnant with my third and my mom was terminal for breast cancer that metastasized to the bone. So, so I was driving um, almost every day, about 40 minutes to take care of my mom while my dad went to work. We had other care also, but I was one of the support systems. And um, anyway, in the end, I'm just really grateful that I was there. I was present with my sister when my mom passed. Mm. So although it was a very difficult thing, it was you know, probably one of the best gifts I've ever been given by God because I really had the opportunity to be there and it till the very last moment. And it really, um, you know, strengthened my faith. And I was just going to ask you, that's probably, I think I know the answer, but I'd love the listeners to hear too. But when you go through something that difficult, what did you find was your best coping mechanism? What helped you the most to be able to get through that? Oh, I just love that question because it, you know, it, it really is an example of how we have to dig deep. And I believe in mantras. I, you know, also Bible verses are always inspiring me, inspiring and encouraging to me. Um, and so, you know, one of the, one of the Bible verses, Philippians four, six, and seven, be anxious for nothing, but everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to God and the peace of God, which defies all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Mm. So gratitude, Mm. right? (laughs) Being grateful that I could be there with my mom, being grateful that, you know, I could, you know, homeschool my, my daughter and, you know, just be there with them. You know, it's interesting. I just, ironically, just yesterday had a coaching client that was going through a difficult time and and uh, has a gratitude journal. And I'm a big proponent of gratitude and a gratitude journal and a gratitude practice. And, but it was interesting. I could see as I was listening, getting some of the updates and he said, so really there isn't much to be grateful for, is there? And I said, well, I said, I'm going to respectfully disagree. And I went back to some of the basics. Do you, did you sleep in a warm bed last night? Do you have a roof over your head? Is there heat in the house? Is there food in the refrigerator and so forth? And so it is so much of a perspective and whether it's somebody's faith or mantra, as you mentioned, or a gratitude journal, I'm such a proponent. Everybody needs that. And that's why I think it's so important. I like to find out what people's coping mechanisms are. Another thing that I've added in the last year or so, which is so helpful for your brain is meditation. 
and just giving that poor brain a chance to just catch its breath, if you will, and so forth. So, so moving on past after mom passed, and then what kind of came down the pike next? Well, we, um, my, my husband at the time had a job opportunity to move to Washington. We were in California and that was really a hard decision because mm -hmm. I felt like I was, you know, the oldest daughter. Um, I have two siblings and I was, you know, hosting Thanksgiving and, you know, holidays. And I felt like I was the hub to keep the family together. My dad released me and he said, no, you know, you need to go. Washington's a great state, great opportunity to raise your family there. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm going to go back to something, if you don't mind, that was instrumental for me in high school. Sure. And so, you know how we all have our high school yearbooks, right? And they're <laughs> Well, in our senior year, we're, we're all asked to come up with a, a quote or something inspirational that reflects who we are. Right. And I remember putting a lot of thought and energy into that. And the one that kept resonating and come, I kept coming back to, even though I was looking for something, you know, let's say a little more profound, um, was Robert Frost, um, two, ro two roads diverged in the wood, and I took the one less traveled Mm -hmm. And that has made all the difference. And in retrospect, over the years, I've looked back one day, I pulled out my annual. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe how that has been my life. And so, you know, taking the road to homeschool your kids is certainly a divergence from the norm, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't an easy decision. And it was one that um, a lot of thought and prayer went into a lot of, I saw a lot of counsel, talked to my pastor, prayed about it. And in the end, I found that it was really a calling. It wasn't, it was a choice. Yes, I chose to do that, but it was also a calling that I chose to answer. And it almost feels like, you know, I guess what I would want to share with everybody is that once you, you know, sometimes you have to grind things. Sometimes it's like, oh, what should I do? How should I do it? I want to make the right choice. And it, and you have to listen to your gut, right? You have to listen to your heart. You have to, you know, it's important to seek counsel, I found. Um, be true to yourself. And, you know, in the end, once you make that choice and walk on that road or that path, it's amazing to me how things just like zip. Like it just like, it just falls into place. It, it's not it's not something that you have to question. I never questioned it after, after that moment. I never questioned my, um, you know, homeschooling my kids. It was often difficult and challenging. I was a single mom while I was homeschooling during part of the time. Um, and I'm actually shocked that I was able to homeschool my three kids being a single mom. Mm, that's a big task. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, when I think about Robert Frost, the road less traveled, it's interesting to me, just by the very way it's written would imply that there's more people on the other road and this is the road less traveled. So it would imply that the majority of people go on the other road. So you mentioned calling, which is a great way to look at it. But another question I have is, so the road less traveled, homeschooling, single mom, three kids, probably not planning on it, probably didn't plan to get divorced and how that worked out and so forth. Where, where did the motivation come from to take the road less traveled for Cindy? Well, you know, I have to say it, it, I think it's just always been in me, but I think me putting it in my album, which was, you know, a conscious choice, of course, you know, uh, thought and prayer went into it, but I'm just amazed at how it's manifested itself in my life. And I can see, you know, homeschooling. And then I, from there, when my kids were raised, um, I actually taught Spanish in the homeschool co-op that I started um, because I needed to provide for myself as a single mom. Mm -hmm. And one of my friends, we were doing, because I was a co-founder of Homeschool Connections, Homeschool Connections, Exceptional Connections. <laughs> that was kind of funny too, because it wasn't intentional. Um, but because I was a co-founder and I was a single mom at that point then, uh, I'm like, well, I've got to, I've got to support myself and my kids how am I going to do this? But, you know, I had helped establish the basically rules and regulations for that co-op and the one parent had to be on site at all times in order for their kids to participate. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, as a co-founder, I had like some of the other co-founders, we all switched off and 
each month taught something to our kids. So I was teaching Spanish to this small group of, of you know, family members. Um, and one of the gals that was a co-founder just said, Cindy, you should teach Spanish. Well, mm -hmm. I hadn't taught Spanish before. I didn't have a curriculum or anything, but I started one grade at a time. I started with um, third grade and created the third to fifth grade module. And then I did K through third grade module. And then I did fourth to sixth grade. And before you knew it, I had eight different levels I was teaching K through 12. Oh, that's cool. And I taught at three different homeschool locations and I had, it was crazy. I mean, but that's how I supported myself for 10 years. Oh, that's, and I would imagine that takes, talk about juggling a few balls, but if you're a single parent, three kids, homeschooling, working, the co-op, all that, uh, I would imagine that took a lot of uh, mental planning and just a lot of uh, uh, ability to juggle all those things at the same time. I can't imagine. Yes. And um, that's funny that you mentioned that. So I created, because I taught so many different levels and I was at three different schools that I had to go to during the week, I had a, you know, those little boxes that you have with the lid with files. Oh yeah. Like, like a carrying file system. And then I didn't have a room. So I had to bring everything I needed, take everything out. And so I had a file system for each grade level. And I had, you know, each class, I had all the kids homework and their new, you know, their new copies. And, and then I had my lesson plan. <laughs> I tell you that because I created this whole process so I could keep things straight. And I thought, oh, I should, I should sell this. Then I started thinking, who would be crazy to do what I'm doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. I, created, I created systems and structures that allowed me to keep my brain straight for the different levels I was teaching in the different locations at the different dates, you know, being able to just pull out of there. Okay, here's your homework. All right, here's the worksheets mm -hmm. for this. Because it was once a week schooling is basically the, the way we set everything up. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was thinking too, I haven't thought about it in a while, but I think of homeschooling and, and I have some uh, ways I look at it, sort of the pro and the con, if you will, but having gone through that, what would you tell the person that say maybe the biggest advantage of homeschooling and maybe a, a disadvantage of homeschooling? Well, I, you know, the advantages of homeschooling is each child has the opportunity to really determine what their gifts are mm. and what their strengths are and and how they learn and be conscious of that and not being put through just you know with the masses because tradition I'm a product of the you know public school system um, thankfully I was a good student so I got through it fine my sister had some learning challenges and you know was always told she was dumb and she's not dumb. She just learns differently. Mm. And um, so, you know, along that vein, my kids were very different. My firstborn is super bright, um, verbal, a voracious reader. She goes to the, she's 38 and she goes to the library and checks out five books, six books a week. Wow. And oh, devours wow. them. Wow. So, um, so, you know, the ability to be able to, um, you know, determine what your gifts are, what your strengths are, and, and develop that and have joy in the learning process that it's not laborious. It's not like I have to do homework, you know, and homeschooling, you don't have homework, you just do the work and you move on, and you have the afternoon to pursue your passions. And um, my daughter played the piano, she, she sang, she, you know, involved in church, my boys were in soccer, um, I homeschooled my daughter um, birth to 12th grade and mm. she was half day kindergarten when we moved from California to Washington. And okay. in her brain, she knew what school was like and she didn't want to have anything to do with it. So that was easy with her. Wow. The boys, unfortunately, never did to go to kindergarten or anything. And they were always thinking they missed out. I say, unfortunately, because they were always like, I want to be with them and I want to be there. And so that was that was hard on them at first. Um, but the ability to just be with my kids, I mean, as a parent, I look back now and I have three kids, 38, 36, 34. My daughter graduated with honors from the University of Washington because as a single mom, she was in Edmonds Community College for three years. 
She got her degree in psychology and right out of uh, University of Washington, she was hired 150 applicants for a research uh, position. Wow, cool. And she left there with honors. Um, she's now in Boston getting her master's in psychology and she's gonna come back, get her doctorate at the University of Washington. So nice. there's one. I have a, my second son is a promotional sales in Boston and he just in Las Vegas last weekend um, when uh, it was acknowledged for number four income earner in promotional sales in the United States. Wow. Um, Self-starter, go getter. He just got his AA. That's all he wanted. But, mm -hmm. you know, my third son, um, I'm answering all the questions by this, by the way. My mm -hmm. third son is a firefighter, had significant learning challenges, um, but learned his way um, and has also uh, served in the U.S. military for 10 years um, in the Air Force. Uh, he had four years um, as a tactical T TACP, tactical air control party. It's kind of like a Navy SEAL or Army Ranger, but for the Air Force. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. um, and now he is a National Guard, Air National Guard in Oregon with fire service. And oh. my boys are married. They both have two kids. Um, none of my kids live with me. I don't support any of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's, somebody may laugh at that, but um, I'll just say I have a few acquaintances. I'm not sure about friends, but acquaintances that have not the best situation when it comes to that. So uh, I'm very blessed. You're very blessed for that as well, because there's some where the, the a couple of cases, the kids are still at home or they've moved back home or they're just that they haven't been able to support themselves, couldn't yeah. finish school. And so uh, when I use the word blessed, that's one of the things that comes up for me is having my my kids be able to pedal their own bike, if you will. And right. so we're, we're both very blessed yeah. in that regard. So, well, let me that, that's and I'm so happy to hear that, too, because that's such a neat thing. And and in fact, let me just before I move on to exceptional connections, which takes us getting towards 2009, and I want to really spend some time on that and have you tell people how you developed that. But as you look back on the parent, and I mentioned about the homeschool, but is there something that you would put at the top of your list? I have a feeling I know what you're going to say, but that here's all these successful children. Is there something at the top of the list that you think kind of uh, was maybe the number one reason if you could only pick one thing? Well, I think it's just being able to, as a family, really bond and be able to have real life experiences. So I, I, I guess I have to say it this way. The number one question I would get from people about homeschooling was socialization. Mm. And I kind of came to a point in my life where I was like, now I answered it differently. So mm. instead of saying, oh, no, not that question again, I go, exactly. That's why I'm homeschooling, mm. because kids shouldn't be socialized by a bunch of five-year-olds. Yeah. They don't mm. learn good lessons from each other. And so my kids were around older people, younger people, me, church their sports, their coaches. Mm -hmm. And so they really had an opportunity, I felt a balanced opportunity to learn being respectful, you know, being hard workers. All my kids had jobs. They did lawns for people in the neighborhood. You know, they did, we did papers, you know, <laughs> I was out there driving the car while they throw in the paper sometimes when it was raining. And so, you know, just a work ethic, um, that I think has served them well. And um, when I started the co-op, they were responsible to the teachers. So they had classroom experiences also, um, mainly because I didn't have the ability to teach chemistry and trigonometry and you know those, those other classes. So that's why I helped start the co-op because my daughter was college bound and I wanted her to have every opportunity. I felt very responsible. I didn't want to ruin my kid's life. Um, so I guess just being able to have time together and not be always running, running, running. Right. And, and that's why I started the co-op because we were starting to do that. We were homeschooling, but we were doing all kinds of things out, outside. And so having the co-op centralize things so that we could have their literature class and their math class and different things that I was subcontracting out all in one place. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the thing I would say to all parents is whether you choose to homeschool, put your kids in private school, get tutors, do public school, always remember you have the right to homeschool. Right. Don't 
you know, give that right away to anybody. And that, you know, the analogy I always give to parents is look at it like a contract situation with, when you're building a home, you know, subcontract out the things that you are not proficient in or comfortable teaching your kids. And it's, it is a little trickier when you have to work with the school system, but always treat it as if you're, they have to answer to you and not the other way around. Cause I think we flip things in our school system, especially in recent years. Especially. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that uh, the contractor and subcontract things out. There's certain things you want to subcontract out and other ones you don't. So I really like that. So no, that's really neat. And I think just in, in given what's happened now in our schools and particularly in a, a somewhat liberal state as we live in, in Washington and Seattle, a lot of things have changed and, and I don't think for the good in a lot of cases and things. So that makes almost maybe a better case for homeschooling than maybe ever before, even though I think the case before was good. So I, can I add one more thing? This will be interesting to your, to your learners. So when I moved from California, I was already thinking about homeschooling. My, my husband at the time was really, you know, interested in me doing that. So I had to really like dig deep. But when we moved to California, uh, homeschooling had only become legal in this state two years before. Oh my before goodness. Before that, it was under, that's how long ago it was. Wow. It had been underground. And so as I was researching home, the you know homeschooling and the resources that were available, I was meeting moms who had been homeschooling for 10 years and they called it underground. Wow. So it was yeah, literally I, illegal. To not it have was, your kids in public schools. It was illegal, but there were moms still doing it, but it was illegal. So when I moved, it had become legal two years prior to. And moving. what year was that, Cindy? Because that's probably not that all that long ago, but then what, what year was that? Um, I moved here in 1998. And so 96, I guess. 1996. Gosh, not that long ago, 25 years yeah. ago, whatever. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I officially started homeschooling in 99 because 98, my daughter was four. But anyway, so oh, it, it, it all worked out, but it was just, yeah. I, I did not that know that. Happened. That is really, that is really interesting. So, well, let's, let's move up to 2009 and one of the, and of course, how you and I, when you and I met and talk about the journey, uh, let's spend maybe five or 10 minutes on this, on the journey of exceptional connections and how the genesis and how that came about because I think given this day and age and certainly post pandemic where we've got zoom calls and all these people that don't get to get in touch with much as as is before but gosh your connections your network whatever word you want to use is so important so talk about that journey and how you put that together yes and you know it really ties in with the quote um, by Robert Frost about two roads roads diverging and I have to tell you it's this is not a conscious thing that I've done in my life like okay I'm gonna go I'm going to go left instead of right. Um, but I just found that, you know, in retrospect, looking backwards, those are the choices that I've made. And it just puts a smile on my face. Um, and one of them was, you know, homeschooling my kids. The other being, um, you know, a single mom and how I, my work opportunities and that kind of thing um, with exceptional connections. So when I finished I had been homeschooling for 10 years and my son, my youngest, my, both my boys went into public school in 10th grade by choice because they wanted to do wrestling and sports and whatnot. And we gave them the opportunity to do that. So I had intended to stop homeschooling and teaching at the same time, but my, my, my classes were full with waiting lists and it was all humming along. And there came a point where I kind of, had a moment to just be still and ask myself my que a question, how long do I wanna keep doing this? How long do I wanna keep teaching? And I realized I didn't wanna be doing it in five years because mm. teaching is difficult, especially when you have 11 classes in three locations, uh, levels K through 12. <laughs> I was grading papers all the time. I couldn't oh, watch a movie without grading papers. I couldn't go on a trip, you know, car trip or anything without grading papers. And it was just wearing me out. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what do I want to be doing next? So I left homeschooling, not having the next thing because mm. I had to leave with integrity. I left in well, our school ended in May, the end of May. We, we just opted to before Memorial day, our school year ended. So I gave notice in January and finalized my teaching in June and decided I had always save money up to get through the summer because teachers don't, you know, especially if they're 
a contract. They don't get paid during the summer. So I decided to give myself the summer and I went to Bellevue Community College. I took the strong test. I took the Myers-Briggs test. And I thought, okay, this next season of my life, I want to be doing what I'm really meant to do. Because I kind of at the time felt like homeschooling was like I, I kind of fell into it or yes, I chose it, but was I really suited for it, right? And right. so, <laughs> so I took the test. I'll make this quick, this part quick. I took the test and it said administrator, teacher, languages. And I'm thinking, what have I done? I love <laughs> my dream job, you know? Um, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't something that I felt like I could go back. So, you know, just moving forward, what do I want to do? Um, I became a certified health coach because I realized I hadn't been taking care of myself as well as I, you know, over the years. And I, so I got on that journey and how can I help others as well? Um, while I was just building that business, because I, I, I could have, I'm very detail oriented. I'm an English major. I have Spanish, you know, so I felt like I could have been a paralegal working in Seattle or Bellevue, but the idea of, I call it jumping out of bed <laughs> for a job. <laughs> yeah. You know, the idea of jumping out of bed every day was like, oh, I don't want to do that in traffic. So the entrepreneurial pathway was part of the road less traveled, right? Mm -hmm. So I was developing that business. And then a friend of ours, in fact, the same friend that met with us when we met that day in Panera, mm. our friend Dennis. Oh, yeah. He, he said, Cindy, you know, I, you're developing this, other, this business. You know, you're going to need a way to follow up. You might want to take a look at this, this, you know, this company, this service. So he introduced me to um, a keep in touch system. And I'd always been a card sender since I've been a girl, a young girl. I wrote all the Christmas cards for our family. I did all the birthday cards for family and friends. I just big believer in acknowledging, thanking and appreciating people. So I thought, yeah, this sounds great. Um, so I started using it in that business. And then I gave myself six months because I didn't have any income coming in, right? right. <laughs> I left my other job. That's not something I normally do either. Right. I'm very, I plan everything, but I just felt like if I wasn't going to do it that way, I'd never make the break. Right. And I couldn't leave the kids mid-year. You know, I, I just, that's the only way I could do it with integrity. So anyway, all this to say is this other business was front and center for me. And it was drawing me more than the, the health business, being a health coach. Um, although I got my certification. Oh, in that's in yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, and so I just, uh, Curtis and I um, had been dating and uh, he sat down with me and we kind of penciled out a proposal for me in, you know, six months because I, I didn't want to get into, I didn't want to do a part-time job while I was building this network marketing business mm -hmm. and then look back because I'm a pleaser. I'm a recovering pleaser. <laughs> I didn't want to look back and say, you know, I put all my heart and soul in this part-time business and I wasn't able to give it to my passion. And so I gave myself six months and in six months, I um, basically was able to make 20,000 in six months. And I met the the criteria goals for income for myself and building the team. Nice. And have been doing it ever, you know, have been that's in that amazing. industry as a relationship marketing strategist ever since. Right. That's really cool. And so then how was, how was exceptional connections, your own get together group, networking group, how did that sort of was born out of that? So 2006 is when I launched my um, relationship marketing strategist business with mm -hmm. send out cards. And I had been going to a lot of networking events. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it networking here and networking there everywhere, you know, here and there, yeah. just all the time, you know, Monday through Friday, make the, I made that a career and started settling in a couple e-women and a couple different groups. And I'm one of those girls that, you know, I like best practices. I'm all about, like you were talking about earlier, the pros and the cons, yeah. um, you know, what are the good things I like about this networking group? What are the things I don't like as much? And so I just started this journey of creating the best practices or looking at this and then creating in my mind and on paper, 
what I would love to see. And so I started showing, sharing that with networking friends and they were like, oh, that sounds great. Where is that? I want to go. Mm. And I'm like, no, that's my, that's my creation. That's what I you know, would, you know, that's what I am envisioning with kind of uh, best practices from other networking events. So they said, Cindy, you need to create that. And so I had some friends. I think I started with 10 people and we got together at a Mexican restaurant in Windmill and the numbers grew and my vision grew. And then we moved to a Mazatlan restaurant in Woodenville. And then we had a second satellite in Montlake Terrace and moved to another restaurant, Pizza Coop in Woodenville. Um, we were sold out. So we had 28 seats and we were having like 30 to 35 people. Wow. So some, some of my team would walk and wander. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, had, you know, spotlight speakers and vendors. And um, so, you know, there were some things that were traditional. We have speakers, we have vendors, but it was all about really connecting at a deep level and witnessing everybody. So instead of breaking into pods and having you only, you know, in a room full of 30 people, you only get to meet seven um, and they only get to know what you do. So I, I'm really big on everybody get seen, heard, and witnessed. We do spotlight commercials for all attendees and they all get to share what they're doing. Um, so anyway, that was, a, it was very much an experiment. And initially it was a platform for my other business um, because I didn't have to run around as much. I had, I got to be a contribution to others and invite them to my networking event. Exactly. Um, but as the years developed, I really started asking more questions like, you know, who are we? Who are we that makes us different from others? And what are the gifts, just like, you know, I helped my kids develop, what are the gifts that Exceptional Connections has to offer our community that nobody else is doing? Right, right. And so, you know, that's where we created a, our promise to the marketplace is, you know, to help business owners, entrepreneurs build powerful relationships through intentional connections. And, you know, over the years, I also determined at Exceptional Connections, this is not just meeting people. It's about education. It's about learning how to network. Mm -hmm. Because I found just like with little kids in kindergarten, <laughs> uh, the blind leading the blind teaches people bad habits. Yeah, and yeah so, I mean, that's a good point. So, um, you know, so there, I found a lot of people well-intentioned that, you know, were introduced to the world of networking. Um, and they were doing things and other people were picking up on them. And I'm like, no, I mean, you got to learn how to shake your hand and look the person in the eye, you know, old school, right? Right, Dave, when we used to do that. Um, you know, so it's really about education, mentorship, diversity of thought, community experiences that transform lives personally and professionally. And so, you know, kind of a, a tweak on what we're already doing, but really the the foundation is building new friendships, endless creating endless referrals, and creating powerful advocates, yeah. and and how to do that. And I'm going to put this in the show notes. The show notes, but what is your website name? So exceptionalconnections.com, mm -hmm. and we also have a YouTube channel, Exceptional what Connections. Is, what is that? Just Exceptional Connections. Okay, that's YouTube. And yes, and we have. Um, you know, replays of past um, spotlight speakers. We also, uh, twice a month, I do conversations to connect, let's get real um, with getting to know members of our community, much like what we're doing here, and um, also spotlight speakers. And, and I was really blessed that you were a recent spotlight speaker oh, for Exceptional you. Connections. You were also a conversation to connect guest, and just so appreciate your- Oh, thank you. Know, you. It was fun. Generosity. It's fun. And it's just, and it's interesting as we went through, we'll wrap up here in a minute. And as we went through the pandemic and as we, as we're on zoom today for the podcast, but and shifted to zoom. And I know I did that, of course, those two things with you on zoom and it's not perfect, but it certainly is something that instead of going, you know, dark, if you will, from all to nothing in person to nothing, zoom did provide sort of a, a nice buffer, if you will, to, to still connect. And 
I, I joke with people. Sometimes there'll be a bunch of us on a Zoom call, and I, I feel like we're all sitting at Starbucks. And yet, the guy this morning, one guy was in New York, another was in Colorado, and you know, we're just this far away. So it's actually been kind of a cool platform. So, but let me, I'm gonna one last question for you, but I want to just kind of go back a few uh, bullet points that I had down that I really liked for those that are listening. Uh, homeschooling, um, one of the advantages to determine what their gifts are. I thought that was really cool. Uh, being able to bond as a family. And I think that's so true. I think the pandemic, that was one of the silver linings of the pandemic, as much as it was tough for everybody, but the family bond, I'm sure, was stronger than maybe some other years. Uh, I love this. You have the right to homeschool. And it, certainly, it sounds like as of 1996, before that, that was almost illegal, which is just crazy to me. And when you look back on your life, homeschooling, being a single mom, developing exceptional connections, and then I think with connections, the exceptional connections, connecting at a deep level, which is so important, Everybody gets to be seen, heard, and to witness. And uh, the blind, leading the blind teaches bad habits. I thought that's great because it's really true. And we all need mentors. And we all have probably, by the time you get to be your age or, or my age, we've mentored people along the way, but we've certainly had our mentors too. And that is, is a really neat feeling to uh, have that be part of it. So uh, part of the learning process and passing it on to each generation and so on. So, well, let me get to thank you again so much for being a guest today. And let me uh, give you my last question. It's the same question I ask every guest at the end. And that is whatever today, today's date is in 2022, what does Cindy O'Neill Dady know today that she would have liked to have known at 18 that would have changed her life or at least would have helped your life? Let's put it that way. Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I, okay, I'll leave you with this. So I've come to appreciate and I would want, I would want the Cindy of today to say to the Cindy that's 18, appreciate the the hard bits in your life don't resist mm. them because that which you resist persists right so everything has played a part in my journey and has made me who i am today um you know many times i've heard and probably you've heard people say put your head down and get to work right mm -hmm. well my mantra is my three g's want to hear them you bet okay look up mm -hmm. get through it with grit grace and gratitude. Yay. <laughs> I'm glad the gratitude was in there too. Grit, grace, and gratitude. Grit, grace, and gratitude. Because oh, grit that's is, good. that's a character quality I've always admired. And I feel like, you know, that's something that I would be proud to have somebody say is a character quality that I have. And to do things gracefully and always have a heart of gratitude. Um, you know, I think we need to talk to ourselves, but we need to do it in a way that is honoring and not just tear ourselves down all the time. So important. Um, yes. So important. And gratitude, I define it as focusing on what you have versus what you don't have. Exactly. One of my, one of my pet sayings is gratitude turns what you have into enough. And when you put, you look at your life through the lens of gratitude, it's just it's such a more pleasant view. And it, it gives back to your three words, it gives yourself some grace too. And I think it's so important. I like the word uh, allow. We, we need to allow ourselves and give ourselves grace about things. And I notice just in general, whether it's podcasts or other things, how many people are so incredibly hard on themselves. Yes. And if they, if they had a hammer or something on this other head would be bashed in everywhere by how hard we pound on each on ourselves sometimes too. So yeah. appreciate the hard bits. And did you say that, that resists persists? Is that what that was? That which you resist. Oh, persists. that which you resist. That which you resist persists. And that's been something that's helped me a lot in my life too, because when I find myself resisting something, mm -hmm. I'm just perpetuating it. Yeah. So to be able to accept it and receive it for the gifts that, you know, are attached to it, because there's always gifts attached to things, even if we don't like them yeah. um, and move on and, you know, bless that thing or bless that person. <laughs> Yeah, it's so important. And it's one of the things I mentioned in podcasts from time to time is the Steve Jobs commence, commencement speech at Stanford in 2005. And one of the things he was most famous for saying in that 15 minute speech was you can connect, you can connect the dots backwards, but not forwards. You have to believe and, and trust that they'll connect going forward, but you can turn around and look, oh, if I took a left that road instead of taking a right, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to Cindy today and so forth. So it's just having that belief, I think is really important. So, well, thank you so much again. And let me leave the listeners with my 
uh, closing comments. Just as a reminder, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. That is always appreciated. And also, I know that people are struggling with a lot of life issues, and so I have a program for my listeners, and it's called the Gratitude Coaching Program. And it gives you a coach that fully believes in you and can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. The support you receive is unmatched in getting you to believe in you and make changes that you have been wanting and needing to make. Whether it's finances, your relationships, your career, your life's journey that you want to change, and this is a great program for you. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance and a very high level of accountability, along with an attitude of gratitude, all combined to ensure your personal success. My six-month proprietary gratitude coaching program is available to all my podcast listeners with an additional two months free of charge. So for more information on that, you can go to thatgratitudeguy.com or thatgratitudeguypodcast.com. Lastly, if you'd like to receive my Monday morning minute, a lot of people like to get that. It's a 60-second video that goes out every Monday morning at 6, 6 a.m. Simply go to your text and text in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And then the text, put in gratitude guy, all one word, and it'll get you a link. And then you can get that Monday morning minute to start your week off on a good note. Thank you again so much for tuning in, viewing and listening. I do appreciate it. And remember, as I always say, remember to be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.